It's a good day to you all. And I pray that uh, this day of the full blessings from the Lord finds you in the best of your health, both spiritually and physically. And um, our lesson today is uh, the heated crucible. And by the way, bear in mind that the whole of this quarter we are learning more about being with Christ in the crucible. But before we proceed, shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessings that you are daily pouring upon us. And Father, as we get together to listen to your holy word through this, morning, through this day's lesson, May we all find comfort in the knowledge that you want us to have so that we can deliver, develop that trust in you. With this we ask in our dear loving Savior's name, Jesus Christ, who is coming again. Amen. Um, the crucible, as you and me will recall, is that instrument used for transforming substances into that which the holder or owner of the crucible wants it to be. And our crucibles are those experiences, hard though they may be, but the whole desire from our Father is to have us be transformed into that which he wants us to be. And did you know that as is the case with entrepreneurship, life is always full of risks. God is also in the business. Like you and me can be in a business of making profits, but God is in the business of serving souls. And as a result, God, like we do, risk our own Monies for our capital, God also risked his son for yours and my salvation. And just as that risk came so that we could, through that risk effort, receive the blessing of commitment by Jesus to be sacrificed by God. We therefore have God him, himself counting upon you and me so that by risking our trusting in God, others may God to see how much beneficial Christ's risked life was to us. We have four figures that we are going to look at this very day. And to begin with, we have Abraham. You and me already know what happened when Abraham accepted to have his, to have his son sacrificed. And Abraham knew that you and me now did not know what you and me now know. When Abraham took his son, he literally knew that he was going to be the sacrifice on that mountain of Moriah. He did not know that God was going to have something else, some lamb, already provided instead of the son. So much so that when he raised his hand to sacrifice the son, he really did it wholeheartedly, committedly, so fully knowing that was what he had to give to God after having heard God's to him 
to have his son sacrificed. But alas, alas, when the voice came to intercept that sacrifice to be done, that's when Abraham got to know God as the provider. When he looked at the lamb that was by the side, which God told him to get it sacrificed in, on behalf of the son. Abraham did not know the significance of that sacrifice, that God himself would in later time have his son sacrificed. Moving on to the next figure, we look at the prophet of the Lord Hosea. Hosea. Now, Hosea, as you and me will recall, was used by God to send a message to the children of Israel that had apostatized. Apostatizing, as you and me may, may know, is to be um, having something in place of God for worshiping. This is exactly what the children of Israel had done. And as a way of um, emphasizing the message that God had to the children of Israel, he had to tell Hosea to marry um, a prostitute, and you know what that meant. And with the pride that every man can ever have, no one would ever have his wife going out once, twice, going again to look for her, bringing her back home showing that extra ability of forgiveness, accepting her back home once, twice, three times, and even more. That message, deliver, is one of the three ways God used to deliver his messages. God delivered his messages through written orally, and through enactments. The written ones is such as the one we got when we received the written commandments from God himself, written by his finger. The oral ones come to us through those discourses that Jesus provided us from the mountain of blessings. You remember those beatitudes? But the enactment is exactly what Hosea did. When he had to take the message to the children of Israel by getting married to a prostitute. This was a very difficult thing to accept by the prophet because such a thing would never be done in the land of Israel, let alone being done by a prophet, a man of God. What did this mean? God was demonstrating his love, for the, his love for the children of Israel. And if you read Jeremiah 2, verses 4 to 8, God asks the children of Israel, what wrong did I do for the nation of Israel? So much so that they found me helpless, not worthy to be trusted, after I had walked with them in the wilderness, after I had demonstrated my ability of protecting them in a wilderness where no man lived. Another man to talk about is Job. When I first learned about the story of Job, I asked myself, and I believed you must, I believe you must have as well. Did, really, did this story really take place? 
because of the things that happen there. Imagine one phenomenon taking place after the other. One bad thing after the other. Children get destroyed. This and that gets lost. The, the domestic animals, the, the, you know, everything just gets out of Job's hand. I've never heard that in my life. But I got to understand that it was a real story. When I got the New Testament writers making reference to Job, that's when I got to understand that the story did indeed take place. But Job did not know that he had been, he had had his name set in a certain committee where it was agreed that he be tempted. He did not know that God himself, whom he had loved so much, had given him to the devil for trials. I don't know what would happen if he had known. But what does this tell us? Thank God for the knowledge. Because today we now know that when certain calamities come one after the other, don't be surprised. You and me are not the first ones. There was someone who has had an experience so that through his endurance, through his spirit of desiring to worship God, even amidst such touching ordeals, Job never cursed God. How many of us have had the name of God cursed? when faced with such trials, coming one after the other. The other figure is, to, is Paul. Paul the Apostle. You and me know very well what happened to Paul. How he was tortured by his own kinsmen, the Jews themselves, who had not accepted the type of gospel that Paul had now brought to the children of Israel by having the Gentiles also included in the salvation from God. The Jews had thought that salvation only was theirs. Little did they know that they were supposed to live a perfect example before the world so that through seeing the children of Israel, the rest of the world would also love the God of Israel. But the children of Israel had failed. So Paul was used by God as an instrument for reaching out to the Gentiles, that include you and me. Paul therefore suffered that torture by the Jews for including the, 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 them the unincludable nations of the Gentiles. Paul, you, re you recall, at some point, asks God to remove some, throne, some thorn in his flesh and how God had responded to say, my man, my grace is sufficient for you. And you recall how Paul, in the book of Corinthians, the second chapter, Paul eventually got to, got to be delighted to know that even in weakness, God would be better be seen and appreciated. Did you know that even in your frailty, your uttermost weakness, God's power can best be demonstrated. The one talking to you is sightless. He's sightless, physically so. 
And I remember, I had such a concern like Paul. He said, how can I save you in this weakness? And I used to ask God, how can I save you in sightlessness? Have you ever seen someone being so effective in any work while sightless, just about committing suicide? God reminded me of the great and large quantities of grace that he had done for me earlier on in my life. And with that conviction, with that conviction, having God presented to me a track record of his success in earlier life, I got to believe in this God that he would still see me through in my unknown future, no matter how bleak it may be. Such is the lesson that Paul learned. God had delivered him from many, many, many trials that would have had him destroyed. And today we now know that God indeed can deliver and use the weakest so that through that weakest weakness, God's power can be demonstrated in a best ever way. And today, and today, like the children of Israel became so helpless when faced by the Red Sea and behind with the children of Pharaoh, with Pharaoh's army behind. How the children of Israel became so helpless and hopeless. Today, because of the track record that God presented to us, we now know that through crucibles, through crucibles, especially when the crucible is heated to become hotter, that's when God's power is better demonstrated. I don't quite know what you currently may be going through. I don't quite know what crucible you are going through currently. Maybe it could be the crucible of um, hypertension. Maybe it could be the crucible of being bewildered. Maybe it could be a crucible of being an orphan as a young person. You have no parent at all. And you're wondering how your future is going to be shaped. Maybe you are out of employment there. That's your crucible. Let me tell you, my dear, lovely friend, that is your cross to bear. Like Jesus said, Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. He says, he who has a desire to follow me must bear his cross. And did you know, did you know that these crosses are the very crucibles? through which God uses to have us transformed into lovely, heavenly peers, which when God looks at, is proud to say, finally, finally, this is the product, product ready to be used to bring others into his kingdom. Once they get to know that your weakness has been used for God's power to be demonstrated, the world will get to know and believe in him. Although painful it might have been for you to undergo the power of the turning of the transforming crucible, but like the adage says, after a storm comes a calm. After that storm, you'll get to know that indeed endurance. I pray that the Lord helps us 
to appreciate these crucibles. Like Paul would say, let's count each and every challenge and take it with joy, knowing that these trials are coming only but for a moment. Very soon, they will be over. And when time for them to come to an end, when we will be in that, in that happy eternal kingdom, we will try to remember. We will try to remember. Try to scratch your head and recall what you once went through. Do you know that no matter how hard you try to recall, you will never, ever remember? Because all these crucibles, with all their trials, will, will have come and gone. May the Lord help us, grant us the power to go through these transforming crucibles, knowing that we already have these predecessors. Abraham, who sacrificed. Hosea, who enacted out the message that God had to have him demonstrate and bring to the children of Israel. Knowing that like Job, we will persevere and at the end, we will get the dividends of perseverance. Knowing at the end that like Paul, we will indeed earn the betterness of working for God in our weakest nature. May the Lord bless this lesson and may, and may it find a place in our lives. Shall we pray our Father in heaven once again? We come before you thanking you, Lord, for these crucibles. Although they bring with them untold pain, such pain which one, when in, the pain, when in them, may never get to see that indeed the pain will come to an end. But through your power, we now know that indeed the pain comes to an end. When we get to the end, the pain brings with it untold excitement, joys of being victorious. Help all of your children who will get to know that crucibles are not for pain, but they are for making us stronger and remain better instruments and better products ready for being in your eternal kingdom. This we pray, Lord, in our dear loving Savior's name, Jesus Christ, who is coming again. Amen.